Buonasera, beautiful people from Italy, visitors. Uh, we are here today to talk about architecture. And in order to do that, I, before I start, let me tell you that I do training and consultancy regarding architecture. So I have a feeling about what some companies do in other places. But I, this is my first time professionally in Italy. So I would like to know how many of you are uh, into architecture already, or have you already applied some patterns? Let me ask one by one, and you keep your hands up when you have been there, okay? MVC. Okay. I would say like 30%. Uh, uh, MVP. Much better, so like 40, 45. And MVVM. Yeah, some hands here too, not so many. Clean. Are you clean people? Yeah. Did you like it? Do you think it's worth to do things in, about architecture? I mean, because most of the comments that I usually get are that architecture is important, but it is tough, and it, it, it really is somehow tricky to make it pay off. And that's something that I would like to prove wrong today. And that's, that's my goal. So please, put your hands on, up, the, the people who said, who have tried clean, and now the ones that keep your hands if you think that it was not worth it. Okay, so only one, okay. Still, my goal is to convince you, okay? Still, uh, what we are going to do here is based on the examples that I use for, this, these ones are going to be for the book that I'm writing, and, and also for the, the trainings that I do. So. This is real code, the code that we usually write, the examples that we write when we are doing the trainings or when, when I share them with my customers. And, and the things that I'm going to tell you about today are very, very simple. So three things. The first one, we are going to talk about superpowers. Who likes superpowers here? I mean, like, are we into comics? Yeah, some hands up? Yeah, okay. So we are going to talk about superpowers, which are important for us as developers. We want to have so many superpowers, as, as many superpowers as possible. And this is the first step. But I would be a really bad presenter if I only talk to you about superpowers from the theoretical point of view. I don't want to do that. So what I want to do instead is to do some life coding. So let me first apologize in advance. I'm really bad at typing and this is going to go wrong. I don't know why, I have tried to practice it, I, it's going to go wrong. You know that the gods of the demos are ready to be uh, spoiling your demo when you do it. But in case everything goes smoothly, I just want to appreciate all the work that goes behind that because mistakes happen and if it goes wrong, yes, please uh, uh, forgive me for the mistakes and uh, bear with me, okay? Finally, we'll, I'll do a very brief reca uh, recap about what we have told, and I will accept as many questions as you wish. Okay, so this is going to be a, I believe, a more practical and theoretical introduction to architecture, and let me start with it. So, let's talk about superpowers. And regarding superpowers, uh, there are many that you can, that you can get. Uh, but the reason why you want to have superpowers is because you want to have an architecture that helps you with the problems that you usually have when you are developing your software. That is the main goal for you when you, uh, when you develop. So you want to have less repetition in your code. That is one of the goals of the architecture, avoiding repetition. Don't repeat yourself. Probably you've heard that so many times. You've heard that repeated many times. So the second one would be to have code that is more reusable, that if you work for a company, that is an agency that is selling code to other companies, the more code that you can reuse, the better, because you are charging for this code twice, three times, four times, but you need to work once. That's good, that's how money is done. So, because it is important for the company, it's important for us as developers, and we do care about having code that is more reusable. Also, we would like to have code Sorry. Code that is more maintainable. Code that, that can be maintained more easily. Uh, I don't know, I mean, like, I've seen people here from, for, uh, uh, from very different uh, ages. I mean, you, I don't know what the 
uh, average is, but I see very young people and people that are like me, not so young, and people that are starting probably are joining projects that the first time they are, that you sit in front of the, uh, your monitor and you start reading the code, the worst thing of that is trying to understand what the people that wrote this code were doing when they thought about this development before you. So getting used to this code is quite tough. So having code that is more maintainable means having code that is more readable, that can be read easily, and that can be shared easily and, and transmitted among the team without so many problems. Another thing that I would like to have is uh, less dependencies. And dependencies are not bad by themselves, but it is important that, that we uh, accept the risk and the responsibility that comes with a dependency. Uh, how many of you have done, has done any application that was related to PARSE? Okay, so, for those of you who don't know, PARSE is a, a cloud backend, so you could uh, store and retrieve data from the backend pretty easily. There was a very powerful API, and the reason for using that was that uh, having an, an, a very simple applica application that was able to replicate data in the cloud and, and have synchronization among different devices was more or less trivial. The problem is that Parse was bought by a company, and that company decided to discontinue Parse. And if you have some code that was using these APIs, then it's really important for you that th that code can be easily replaced, that it doesn't affect as much as it can, uh, the code base that, that you have in order to replace that code in your code base. So that's a very important thing. But also, we are developers and we are proud of that. And, and we are proud of the quality of our code. That means that our code is not good because we think it is, or because we say it is, but because it's tested. That having a code that is uh, Testable means that something has been done in the process of creating that code that allows, uh, allows us to, to, to do the testing in a more easy way. Finally, we are into a very fast-paced uh, fast business today, which means that usually we get requirements from the business, from the owners of the companies that we work for, that want some change in place yesterday. And that is always the case. I mean, like, I don't know why, why, why they don't choose tomorrow. They always choose yesterday. And you have to have it ready by yesterday. And it's almost impossible, if you can do try and traveling, then not so much, but still really tough to get those changes in place. And it's particularly tough if when you try to add that change to your code, the rest of the code breaks up. You need code that is stable enough that accepts changes in a very powerful way. Uh, and it doesn't imply breaking the rest of the things that you have already in place uh, in your code. So these are the things that, would, uh, that we would get from an architecture and that people, some people reject to accept as benefits from an architecture because they don't see the payoff of these uh, benefits as an immediate thing. But let me tell you what is the secret behind all these features. Behind all of this, there's money. And that's why we want to put all these features in places, and that's why we want to have a good architecture in our projects. Not because we are good coders and we are proud of that, but also because you want to become rich, and you know that this is the way to become rich. Look at, I mean, like, how many limos have you seen at the entrance of this place? So many, because we're developers. So that's, that's what we can do if we write good code. But it's also pride, I mean, like, there is also the important thing that is writing good code and being proud of it, being able to show it to other people. And well, it is very funny because when I do training or uh, pair programming with customers, there is always like uh, 15 to one hour, depending on how bad the code is, uh, period of excuses. Well, we did that, but this was because it was necessary at the time. We know how to test, but we don't have any tests in place. Uh, we know how to do this properly, but it is not done here. So those excuses are, come very, very often when you work with uh, very, I mean, like I had a friend who, who was uh, finishing his PhD and he joined a company, and he sent me an email saying, I'm really worried because 
uh, these companies seem, seem to be really professional and, and, and they don't have as many tests as I was expecting in place. And I said, no, don't worry, I mean, like, this is average. I, I wouldn't say that that's even a bad situation. If you have some, then you're good. Some companies don't even have any. So you should push for that, you should have some testing, you should have a good architecture in place, and that's what I'm trying to sell you here. Convince you that it is worth to spend the time in having this architecture in your applications. So, let's go with the first uh, superpower that we can get, and that is super usability, meaning that we can take some piece of code and move it to some other place with minimum effort. I wouldn't say none, but minimum effort, okay? And the key thing behind that superpower is the ability to uh, have classes to apply the single responsibility principle. Um, I believe that many people here has a, a university background in computer science, probably is the case of most of you, but for those who aren't, or for those who didn't get to know this, uh, the single responsibility principle means that a class must have one and only one reason to change. So you are implementing a class that is dedicated to do just one thing. If you have too many things in your classes, then your classes ha might break because of many uh, reasons and may have too many problems. Changing them is complex, testing them is even more complex, and which is the class that is now in your mind thinking about why not should do, uh, why, why not should do that? I mean, probably activities? Is the class that, that you put everything in and everything works there? Because it's easier. I mean, like you put everything inside of the activity and it works. Why should I move it elsewhere? I mean, I, I don't need to move it elsewhere. It's working there. But when you want to reuse that code, then you have to do the extraction of this functionality, and that is tough. When you want to do the testing, well, we will talk about testing later, but testing an activity is not as easy as it is testing uh, a local tests, I mean, unit tests with only the Java virtual machine. We want things that, are, that, makes, uh, that make our lives easier. We don't want to complicate in excess our life, so we better have uh, classes that are dedicated to have one single responsibility. So, if for those of you who were uh, mentioning at the beginning uh, that you were using or that you have played with uh, model view controller, model view presenter, model view view model, one of the most common questions uh, that I believe if you do a search in, in Stack Overflow, that is, as you already know, uh, the source for all knowledge in Paramin, uh, if you do a search about where do I put my network class or my uh, async task or anything that is not strictly model view or controller? Uh, you will see very different question, very different answers re uh, related to that question. And well, the main reason behind that is that people want to apply like these three buckets and they want to put the thing inside of one of the three, and they don't consider that they may have some other responsibilities in their code which is why you may want to have some additional stuff besides just model view controllers or model view presenter or model view view models. So, it is very likely that, imagine that you are writing an application that does some bank accounting and you want to show this application, I mean, you want to show information about this application to the user that is related to the deposits or withdrawals that the user is doing. So whether they are getting money out of their account or putting money in. And you want to change the way the information is displayed based on the fact, the action that the user is doing. So you may do something very simple like making it green when the money gets into savings and making it red when it when it's out of the account. Well, this presentation logic is very likely that you're going to use it in many activities in your application. And if that is the case, probably you want to extract that in a different class. Also, if you want to do the uh, formatting of the currency, if you're using different currencies, or if you're uh, thinking about some other stuff like the dates for relative dates in that to-do app that you always wanted to do because there's need for another to-do app. So, Another thing that may happen is that you may have more than one 
repository of information. And that is very useful. If you have parts, that's something that you usually want to do uh, because you want to be isolated from, from parts. And don't get me wrong, I have nothing against Firebase. I think it's a very powerful tool, but do the same. I mean, like, isolate the rest of your application for Firebase because you may want to change your backend later or you may have a different need for, in order to reuse that use case in another application that for any reason cannot use Firebase. It is also possible that you use more than one. Like, I imagine that you are uh, you're writing one of these running applications and that you want to do the, the um, saving of your data, not only in RunKeeper, but also in Runtastic, maybe also in the health part of the, uh, um, of the SDK. So you can save this data in many places and you can obtain data from many sources. So you may have access and, um, in order to read and to write from different repositories. It's also the case that if you want to abstract that and you want to go one step further, you may want to abstract the business logic in its own classes. I mean, and I will show that in a moment. If you do that, you can reuse those because they are abstract enough so they can be reused in another application without any actual change in order to use them with other backend or with another application, with another activity that shows completely different information. Second superpower, super independence. And well, this goes uh, for the mention that I did for Firebase or for Parse or for any other library that you need to use. Imagine that now you're using uh, Google Calendar for your calendars because you want your events uh, from there. But now you have a requirement for another company that says, okay, but I need the events from Microsoft. I mean, are you going to lose that customer because uh, you cannot extract the calendar information from another product? No, you better not do that. So the thing here is the application of the dependency inversion principle, which is another one of the solid principles. And the dependency inversion principle states that, well, when you have a high-level code, your application, the logic of your application, that uses low-level code, in that case it would be the access to the calendars, you don't want to have references from the high-level code to the low-level code. So use Google Calendar API exactly inside of your business classes. You don't want that. Instead, what you do is you destroy this relationship and you create an abstraction. That abstraction provides you with an interface that is the thing that you are going to use in order to take advantage of any calendar API that you want. Please keep in mind that calendar API is here as an example. This would work for repositories of any other kind of data, or also if you want to use Wave devices or any other thing. I mean, it doesn't have to be related to persistence per se. It can also be related to sensors or any other frameworks that you have in the system. So what the code will do instead of making uh, explicit references to the low-level API is to use the high-level abstraction that you have defined. So give me a calendar and give me the events in that calendar. That could be something very feasible for a calendar API. And then you will have an adapter, something that, that, that implements the glue code that is the one that talks between the interface that you have defined and the actual implementation of that code, the library, the framework that you are using. By doing that, if you want to replace the low-level stuff, the, the framework that you were using by another one, you just have to write the adapter. That's it. Then the rest of your code will work flawlessly with the implementation that you already have in place. OK. Let's go with the third one. And with this one, I'm going to be very brief because I think there were much better talks about testing here than the ones that I'm planning to do here. And I'm just mm, trying to give you uh, some insight in, on why this is worth and how to do some very basic unit testing here. So make your dependencies explicit. If you want to do testing, for example, if you want to do the testing of the formatting of your uh, currency, you want this formatting to be a dependency of your business case. You don't want the formatting as a given. In the typical case. 
things that are related to dates. I want to see if this fires up, if this task uh, it, that I have set up for today is uh, today the date. OK, so you do uh, the test, and you run it, and it works today. But that test has to run forever. So you better inject the date if you want to be able to test that in the future, because otherwise the testing is not going to work for you. So by making your ex uh, dependencies explicit, you have the ability to inject them in order to test them. Not only that, you can also make the, the, the dependency injection easier. Who is using Dagger 2 here? OK, any other de independency injection framework? That, that was like a 25%, 30%, some other dependency injection, juice or something like that? OK, in any case, you can also do manually your dependency injection, which I guess is what the rest of the people is doing, because I know that you do the testing, and this is, I mean, you don't have an excuse for that. So you are doing the injection by yourselves, you're doing fine. Uh, the rest of the people is using Dagger, but we will talk about Dagger in a second. And if you implement the other principles that I was mentioning and the other three that are the solid principles that I was mentioning, and any other principle that is related to mm, best practices in terms of uh, writing code, I think that they provide you with benefits in order to write the test. So don't ignore them, please. I mean, like, as much as you can, follow those principles. The only thing here is that if you want to do Dagger or Juice, I don't know about Juice because I haven't used it in a while, but uh, Dagger, explicitly says, don't use Dagger for unit testing. It's not my word, it's theirs, OK? So you may accept it or ignore it, but the recommendation is don't use it for unit testing. So what I'm going to do here in the live code, the uh, live coding part that I'm planning to do is to show you an alternative in order to do that, and I hope that you like it. OK, that was for the theory. I hope that you are still awake. Did you took two espressos before coming to this talk? I think it was a requirement in the, in the program, was it? OK, so now I'm going to do the coding. And if I make any mistakes, I'm sorry. Yes, bear with me. If you see that I'm making the mistake, don't wait till the end, OK? So let's go with that. Uh, so for the first scenario, what I'm going to do is the reuse logic that I was mentioning before, okay? And let me show you what I plan to share with you today. And this is my application. Uh, my application, uh, do you know LinkedIn here in Tele? Is, is it very common? LinkedIn? LinkedIn? Oh. <laughs> okay, so you guys are like us in Spain. Okay, so... LinkedIn is the proper name, but uh, LinkedIn sounds fine by you, okay? So, this is going to eat the lunch of LinkedIn, okay? This application is the, the, what is needed in order to hire developers. I mean, like, they are doing a great job, but we can do better because we are developers. We know what is needed in order to hire people. So, these are developers, and what I do here is when I, oh, this is, why is it changing the resolution? Sorry about that. Really, what is, oh, okay. So, sorry, it was the change of the resolution. So, uh, what you do here is when you create a new parameter, uh, you can, as you can see here, you can add a name for that parameter and the two skills that are essential for knowing how, pro how good a parameter is. How much Amax you know and how much caffeine can you drink? The more caffeine, the more Emacs you know, the better you are at programming. This is how it works. So everybody knows that. The LinkedIn doesn't, but we do. So we wrote this application in order to prove that this is the best way to hire in programmers. Obviously, when you change the, the knowledge of Emacs and the caffeine, well, the rating is what you get uh, as a change for that, okay? So you, based on the interviews that you do to the people and when you ask them how much caffeine can you drink and how much Emacs do you know, you can choose that this person is a favorite or that it, she or he is not, okay? And then you can store that or just ignore it, okay? Uh, so do I, yeah, I want to ignore the changes and I have a couple of parameters here and well, uh, another thing that I can do is to visit one of the parameters and I can actually change the favorite status of this parameter as you can see here, and it will be updated in the main list. Very simple stuff. 
I'm pretty sure that you are saying, well, this is boring, but we're going to do tons of money because of that. So what I'm going to do here is to show you how to reuse the toggle uh, use case in the main list. In the main list, and let me prove that this is not working first because it would be cheating and I have nothing up my sleeves. Uh, uh, I would do a long tab, which I'm doing now, trust me, that I'm doing now, and it, it will change the favorite status of the row that I'm tapping on, okay? So what I'm going to do here, let me show you the code. I have here uh, four packages, and in these four packages, I have the different layers of clean architecture. So I have one that is meant for the data, uh, another one that is meant for the domain logic, so that means the entities and also the business cases and also the use case factory that I'm going to use. Another one that is the platform, let me uh, open it so you can see it here. Another one that is the platform that is the one that contains the, the connectors and the views, uh, the things for navigation in this case, is the, it is also doing the dependency injection because in that case I wanted to do it manually and the other one I will show you that can be done with Dagger. And, uh, also the application class that I'm using for this application. And finally, I have the presentation layer which contains the presenters and also some utils like the one that I mentioned for uh, a relative date or for some colors based on the skills of the parameters. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to show you, uh, let me hide a little bit this, uh, to show you the parameters list activity which is the, the one that was behind the list that I showed you before. And in order to do that, is it readable from the end of the room? Can you read it? Or is it too big? Too big. So let, let me then make it smaller. Can you read it like this? Is it fine by me? Okay, perfect, thank you. So uh, what I have here is a very simple activity. I have the onCreate method here and using uh, different methods from, for the different abstraction layers, I have this, the content view created, uh, uh, set. Uh, I have the, option, the action bar uh, set up, the action button. I connect the pieces. I connect the presenter, the use case, and all the stuff. Then I inform the presenter that the view is ready in order to load the data. And finally, I set up the recycler view. That's pretty easy. That's what the onCreate does. And uh, in order to do the recycler view setup, I have this uh, method that is taking advantage of another uh, class that implements these two methods, the on item click and on long item click. I have already implemented the one here for the presenter, uh, for, sorry, for selecting the item in, that is communicated to the presenter. And what I'm going to do here is to implement the other one for the long tab. So let me go here, let me uh, do the M presenter, long tap position and semicolon. Okay, lots of work here, but this is the activity. This is all I have to do in the, the activity in order to add this functionality. Uh, I'm really tired, but I, I'm well paid, so I will do something else, okay? I'm going to go and create the method in the presenter, so it implements that. It offers me to do that in, well, in an interface that I'm not going to do, and the parameters list presenter, which is the one that I want to use. It is void, and it will take an integer, which is the position. So far, so good. Oh. Thank you. Much better? Thank you. Keep me informed, okay? <laughs> so, this is the long term method. Now, the view has told the presenter, hey, the user has done a long tab in one of the rows, okay? Okay, so now I'm going to implement the toggle for the favorite status. Okay, so I create a use case. I'm going to call it use case. And it's going to be coming from a use case factory. And the, sorry, not this one. And use case factory, yeah. And what I'm going to do is to create this one, which is the toggle fabric use case. Uh, it's asking me for two pieces of data. The first one is the ID of the parameter that I want to change the favorite status uh, for, and that is M parameters uh, get uh, position, and for this one, I get the ID, okay? And 
The second parameter would be the callback if I want to do some changes afterwards. In this case, I don't need to do anything. The main list is going to be updated because the, view, the model is going to notify the activity that it changes. Okay, so I will use null for this one, and, and that should be it. So I now have created the use case. But when you have a use case, what is the next thing that you have to do? You execute it. This is following which design pattern? Command, great, thank you. So I don't have chocolates for those who were in the Raspberry Pi room. Sorry. OK, so now that this is here, let me run this one. Uh, I haven't implemented the optimizations that Igor was mentioning before, so it's going to take some time. Still, uh, hopefully what this is going to do is to add this use case in the main uh, activity. And by doing that, uh, we are going to be able to do long tap and uh, is it what did I? Here we go. Okay, just by doing a long tap on the row, this use case that was used in another view is now reused in this one. Okay, first scenario. Let me go back to the presentation to mention the second one. So, second use case scenario is going to be replace the backend. And here goes a very interesting thing that I uh, think that some people miss when they are doing prototypes. Sometimes you are asked by your company or maybe yourself, you have a great idea on something that you would like to implement that is going to be great. You're going to become rich in two hours. But then you start creating a prototype. And then you start thinking, how do I implement that on Realm? Or how do I implement that on Firebase? How do I implement these details in something that is not adding any value to your proof of concept yet. So don't start with that part. I mean, like, I'm not saying that this is not important. I'm just saying that this is not the, the first thing that you should do when you're writing a proof of concept. So instead, write some kind of in-memory repository or the easiest thing that you can do with uh, some local file. I mean, whatever makes your life easier in order to write that proof of concept. In this case, what I did for this example was to, let me show you, um, create, sorry, not this one. Uh, uh, I created an in-memory repository, which was pretty easy. It was ma managing an array of, uh, array list of parameters. Okay, but now the application is growing. I'm about to get the, one, the first 100,000 million users. And I have decided that keeping them in memory is not possible. So now I'm planning to change to real. And in order to do that, what I want to prove to you now, and see, nothing up as leaves, uh, what I'm going to try to prove is that by changing only the reference to that class, I can change the whole behavior of the application, okay? Nothing in the rest, in the presenter classes or in the business use, in the use cases that are part of the business, uh, the domain logic, are, is going to change. Obviously, nothing in the activity is going to change, okay? So what I'm going to do is I will go to the Gradle scripts, and here uh, I will, and I know this is cheating, but I have some snippets in place. Uh, I will add a reference to the Realm uh, plugin, and obviously, not only here, but I also need to apply the plugin here. Okay, so now I think, hopefully this is cache, so nothing is going to be happening here. And in my data package, I'm going to create a new one that I'm going to call real in order to have the real implementation here. And I'm going to create a new class that is going to be called uh, Parameter real. This is going to be. This is really important. This is the interface between the subclass of the real object that you have and your entity that is framework agnostic. Okay. So I create that, and uh, yes, uh, I'm going to. And I know it's cheating. Just trust me that this is more or less setters and getters and nothing else. And uh, Mm, two, three, yeah. So this is the implementation of this class, which as you can see, is an implementation of real object there. 
and it has the properties that I want to store in Realm. And it does the translation between a parameter and a parameter Realm, which is the one that I'm using internally for the rest of the thing. Obviously, I need the other thing that is the implementation of the Entity Gateway, which I'm going to create right now. And I, this is going to be uh, the Realm repo. And in order to have this, I'm going to cheat again and create all the code that, as you can see here, well, this is the part that is meant for the notification. So, sorry, no breakpoint here. And here, you can see, let me hide this for a while. Um, Mm -mm. So here you can see that I have the update method, the fetch parameters, and the create. So the, the functionalities that you would use in a repository implemented for Realm. So now that I have this, the only thing that I need to do is to go back to the uh, instantiation of that class, the, word, the place I do the reference, which is in the injection. In this case, I do this in the, in the main class. and here, as you can see, I was using an in-memory repo. So instead of that, what I'm going to do is I create another reference to the entity gateway, and I say new real repo, OK? And well, and if I'm, yeah, and this. And the, the reference to the context, because this is what you need in order to create a repo, OK? So if I haven't done any mistake, these should be able to work properly. And you will see that because the data that is in the Realm repo is slightly different to the other one. So you will see that it's not exactly what you saw before. If I, if I did this properly, there are some data here. Now it's Martin Bishop, David Lightman, and still the things will work as before, okay? So it works exactly the same. The rest of the application hasn't been changed, but the uh, persistence has completely changed with just yes, the change of these two classes. Okay, so let me go back to the presentation and introduce the final scenario. And this is going to be, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> the testing. So the testing, uh, well, one of the things that I, I did this, this is cheating, and I know I shouldn't be telling you this, but I did the same presentation for Swift in New York. And uh, I did the same thing for iOS. So uh, that presentation, I was proving that the coverage of the code base was uh, very high. But for us in Android, we have a limitation that is, well, I wouldn't call it a limitation, but it's a, a constraint that in order to be able to do the testing between the views and the presenters, you have no other option, no, no other real option than to use uh, um, uh, the testing, uh, the Android test, the, um, what, sorry? Espresso. Espresso, yes, thank you. It's been in Italian, not really enough, espresso, totally wrong. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So the thing is that in order to do that, I have an earlier stage here of the same project. So uh, let me, mm, Let me stop this one, let me hide it, and let me go with the other one. And in this case, what I have here is espresso testing for these classes. But remember, we cannot use Dagger2 for testing. So what is that we are going to do now? Well, this is, as I said, an earlier stage of the testing, of the writing of the same application that I showed to you. And uh, in this case, I have already created the, uh, the Parameters list activity, but the parameter detail activity is not there yet, or the create activity is not there yet. It's going to be, but it hasn't been full created. It's only the activity, but it, it is not communicating with the presenter. So what I'm going to do is to show you uh, that, uh, sorry, not this one, but the views. Uh, this edit activity is the one that I would like to communicate with the uh, uh, with its presenter. So the presenter is already here, is the, this uh, presenter that has already been set up, but I'm not yet telling the presenter, I'm ready, I'm available to do the, 
the things that, I, that you want me to do, okay? So what you want to do here is to add another method here. Uh, let me, I, I'm sorry, but I need to hide this. I hope it's going to be much better with this, okay? So what I'm going to do here is to create a, a reference, a call to a, a method that is going to be called inform presenter view is ready, so it is pretty clear. I have written a lot of Objective-C code, don't take it against me, but that means that I, I have no shame in writing long names, okay? So that should be pretty clear and I think that is really helpful if you want to read it properly. So what you do now is you implement that method and that would be this method here, which is the inform presenter view is ready, which tells the presenter that the view is ready, okay? Notice that it is ready because it hasn't been implemented, so what I'm going to do is use alt tab, uh, sorry. <coughs> and it creates the, the method in the presenter, uh, but I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm not going to in implement the logic yet. That part of the logic, I will be able to test it with regular unit tests, with the local ones. I'm only worrying now about the other stuff that I wanted to do. So I close the presenter and I come back to the activity. Here, I'm going to uh, comment this line because uh, I, don't, I want to prove first the test doesn't pass. Sorry. Much better? Sorry. So uh, here, I'm going to comment out the line in order to, to first prove that the test doesn't pass, then and comment the line to check that the test works properly, okay? So what I'm going to do here is to create the test, and in order to do that, I create a new test, I call it, I use the default name for that, I use, create a setup and teardown methods, and I create it in the Android test package, okay? So here, what I'm going to do in the, this test is first create an activity rule, or oh, well, first let me select the runner that I'm going to use, so that is going to be uh, this runner, and, and I'm going to create the activity rule that I was, is this one? Yeah. Okay, so now I accept all the imports, and in, I need to define two uh, fields in this class that are going to be uh, The, the suit, the system under test, the activity that I'm testing, and the presenter that I'm going to mock, okay? And I'm going to mock it because I'm not using Dagger in this occasion. So, uh, what I'm going to do here is in the setup, I'm going to create uh, the presenter as a mock using Mokito, oh. and I create a default intent and the activity rule fires and injects the presenter in the test application and the test application provides that into the injection of the activity, okay? So, yes, for cleanliness, because we're, as we said before, we are clean people, uh, I will null the suit and the presenter and I create a new test here that I'm going to use Oops, sorry. Much better? I'm going to call this method on create invokes presenter view ready. And what I'm going to implement here is just the verify that the presenter gets invoked in the view ready method. And that's it. I don't need anything else. So let me run it. And let's see that it fails. Remember that I commented out that line. So when you see that it's failing, it's not because of the gods of the demos, it's because of me, still, okay? So as you can see here, it is trying to run all the tests and only this one, because I have the other one uh, fully tested, the communication with the presenter, here this one fails because it's not communicating with this one. So what I do again is I come back to the activity and I, and comment, sorry, I, uh, I com and comment this one and delete this comment, which I'm not going to need and again. Uh, 
Okay, so if I did this properly, now it is testing the communication with the presenter, and as you can see, you can test every communication with the presenter very easily. Not only that, I mean like now it's green, not only that, I can also have tests for the rest of the logic here, which would be, uh, let me run this properly. This is the, these are the local tests. And as you can see here, uh, besides the things that are uh, the injectors and the activities, the rest is 100% covered. So, uh, thanks to the gods of the demos. And uh, these are the things that I think that are, were more important of this talk, uh, that ar architecture, uh, contrary to what some people say, has real benefits and they apply to every situation. So it is good for you to spend some time uh, devoted to better, writing better code. The best way to do that is by learning the principles, by learning the design patterns. And yes, I know that this is one of the biggest uh, comments that I have from people is, well, I would like to do that, but my code is not like that. And, and it, it is hard to change from what I have to something that is well architectured. Well, do it incrementally. I mean, like, you don't have to change the full application. It is completely feasible to do it one piece by piece, and, and it will help you each time. I mean, like, start with the parts that are more conflictive, that are more flaky, uh, more, uh, less uh, robust in your code, which are the ones that are going to be the benefiting the first from that. So other than that, my recommendation is to get your own superpowers, and I think they are going to be good for you. And I'm really, really thankful, Gracie, Gracie Miller. Uh,